Hi there. In this next section, uh, we're going to continue to look at different mass traditions in West and Central Africa. And as before, I really want to call attention to not only the traditional way the masks are done, but also some of the ways that they've changed and they've innovated and the way in which innovation is really a very important part of the mass traditions and this is the way they continue to respond to modern changes in modern life in Africa today. So there's quite a number of different cultures we're going to be looking at. The Barga, the Yoruba in Nigeria, the Songe, who are just a little north of the Pende, and the Chokwe, who are a little further south and west of the Pende we talked about last time. To begin with, let's talk about the Baga and the uh, very impressive Nimba, Nimba or Ndibba mask that you see before you. This is a huge, huge crown mask that's quite uh, impressive and heavy. And it is a very important part of an uh, ancient tradition among the Baga and the Malinke. In this time, you've, you have a uh, this celebration of the mother. And this, you see, this sort of bare-chested, powerful, uh, dramatic head rising above the shoulders, and this sort of raffia that wraps around it. It's very forceful, projecting face with this impressive nose and bulging eyes and a kind of crown of hair that rests right down the center. These masks are meant to create a sense of kind of majesty and elegance and power of the role of mother in people's lives. Now, there's a lot of things that have happened among the Baga, and one and very important change that's concurred is the uh, gradual embrace of Islam. And with the coming of Islam into the region, there was a push to kind of move away from these traditional practices. This came to a head with 1958. There was an Islamic uh, uh, push for what they called demystification, where they were going to sort of ban all these earlier traditional practices. And the Baga, Dimba, celebration was a part of that. You can see here people standing next to the figure. Today, this does not exist anywhere except in museums of African art. It's actually uh, a mask that is from the collection in the Art Institute of Chicago. And you can see they have this really very striking proportions, very kind of powerful nose and crown uh, across the top of the head. And the very interesting sort of treatment of the ear, uh, the sort of long extended face um, that stretches outward with the small nose, uh, small mouth below the very large nose. So uh, these masks, of course, uh, became very uh, curious part of the African culture, when people look at uh, from Europe came and were looking at African art, they were very excited by this distortion of the uh, human features. Uh, one such artist we'll talk more about later was uh, Picasso. You can see in his bronze head of a woman from 1931-32, where he's very clearly drawing ideas from African art, the Baga Imba tradition. And of course, someone of Picasso's stature takes interest in something like African art. Suddenly, this sort of raises the interest in the, of what is going on in African art. And it may well have been the attention that Europeans had for these traditions were part what sort of doomed them from, to obscurity later as people became very self-conscious about the kinds of questions people had about the way they represented human form. Among the Baga today, there are still uh, new dance traditions that have been created. One very interesting one that has emerged out of Islam is a tradition which uh, used to be the Sibondel, 
Uh, and then as it was appeared in the 1930s, it was this uh, sort of box with a, a collection of uh, figures in it. And um, it was the head of a hair, symbolizing agility and cunning and negotiating danger at a time when Malinke and political religious threat was beginning to affect them. So in the late 1940s, it was sort of incorporated in the largely Malinke uh, elite of the mid-century. Finally, it was a suggestion of, you know, cleverness and prowess. It changes in 54 with the arrival of Islam and a new tradition is created. This man by the name of Salo Bangura, who has this idea of, of celebrating Al-Barak, the creature that carried Muhammad up into heaven. And so you can see this uh, figure, this mythical creature, this winged fit creature now sort of taking on the Sibondel structure and then sort of making it into this now the celebration of the ascension of Muhammad to heaven. And so this now is a, is a kind of new tradition that he sort of uh, embraces Islam, but of course is not in keeping with many of the tenets of his, of st uh, sort of traditional Islam in, in the Middle East, because it has these representations of figures and animals in and, and a way that um, Muslims outside the Baga region may not understand. You can see here the Al-Barak. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. We mentioned Islam uh, in the first section. And here you can see, again, how it would be worn on top, much like the Baga Nimba crest. It rests on top of the head in a sort of large tent-like structure, completely masks and covers the person below. Now I want to move on to uh, the Yoruba. We've talked about the Yoruba already. If you remember, the Yoruba were the people who were instrumental in the Ifa divination, the twins figures, and the Shango um, cult. And Yoruba have many mask traditions. Probably one of the most famous is the Gelede. And we see lots of these masks. They appear, all of, there are many, many of these masks that have been made. And they are there to celebrate the goddess Iana, who is the sort of ideal archetype of femininity. And so the mask is all things that are virtuous uh, about women. As we've seen elsewhere in Africa, they also can take on the sort of negative roles, the sort of warning, don't go here and be that sort of thing. So the goddess Iana is, is a goddess of uh, women's power. And women's power is often manifest in things that fly, like birds of the night. And so you see this uh, Gelede mask with a biplane on it. Again, it's sort of celebrating this idea of ingenuity and creativity and flight, which is this very important idea uh, associated with women. And so this is and modernity and a lot of other ideas that are sort of celebrating what is possible uh, within the role of the woman. Traditionally, as you see here on the left, the mask can have birds on it, can have twisting, interlocking snakes. It can be this huge, complicated tumult of interlocking forms made from many different pieces of wood sort of pieced together. The face below, uh, this sort of a tumult of activity above, is the serene, contemplative, and ideal woman. So as we can see here, the Gelidae represent a lot of different ideas. Um, we can see this idea of snakes and birds as a common, more traditional themes but also just this idea of invention and wonder and something crazy and outrageous like a motorcycle leaping off someone's hat. These are more modern interpretations, but the underlying themes of innovation and wonder and excitement are still present. Notice how in the snakes, how the snake is, snakes are fighting over an egg there. At the same time, the bird is biting the snakes. There's a kind of a sense of tumult and uh, fun uh, and playful quality as well. As I mentioned before, there is a, a part of the performance which is also uh, 
negative examples of a women's. And in this case here, we see a lewd and lascivious woman mask where this woman is bending over and revealing her buttocks um, for anyone to see. It shows a kind of, the, the, obviously, the sort of absurd gesture is meant to show, you know, this is not the way women should behave. So this is a sort of a counterpoint to all the other examples of innovation and fun and wonder, which are positive examples of women's achievement. In the evening, we have an Ife dancer who comes forward. You see here he's got a microphone and he is going to now be telling jokes and stories and songs, again, celebrating uh, the role of Iana in their lives. Another very fascinating, very broadly uh, done Yoruba tradition is called the Igungun. And the Igungun you see in a number of different variety of forms throughout uh, Yoruba land. And it's a very important celebration of the idea of ancestors. Each family, which is a kind of a clan, each clan of an extended family, will have an igungan, and they will have with the, the richest fabrics they can em employ, the most dazzling materials they can make it. They want bright reds and, and golden yellows and blacks and a kind of shining and shimmering uh, full of uh, decorations that call a sense of wonder. Uh, this costume is worn over the person, and you see where the striped part is in sort of the upper center there. That's a slightly transparent area, so the person wearing it can kind of see through the costume. And the costume is uh, in this kind of vibrant and intense and exciting uh, manifestation of the ancestor. Now, the story of why the Agungun comes to being comes back from Ifa divination, where one of the divinations describes the idea of the, the patas monkey and the, how he. Uh, was had an ancestor, both a human mother and a monkey. And the Patas monkey wanted to honor his human mother. And so he put on this Igungun costume to hide his monkey nature and celebrate the, uh, the human that's within him. The Patas monkey, as you can see here in this example, is a monkey that is primarily gold and red and uh, white and black flecks. And so the, the clothing of the Agungun, kind of the coloration of the Agungun, kind of mimics the coloration of the Patas monkey. The Agungun is uh, often depicted in a sense of kind of swirling and moving as the wind uh, kind of gathers underneath and is blown and is meant to spread fertility. Uh, there's also a little drawing here on the right where you can see a, a figure kind of holding up a board so it allows them to turn and shake and move pretty freely even though they're entirely hidden underneath there there's a kind of extraordinary vitality and energy and excitement that comes from the igungun dance and it's part of this idea of the, the 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 vital force of the ancestors come and be reborn and uh, continues to thrive in the community Another very important area or traditional mask is the use of masks among the Songhe, the Kifibwe masks, or Bifibwe, if you're talking about multiple, a Kifibwe mask. These masks are made for the Bwada Bwa Kifibwe Association, a type of policing society that provides a means of controlling social behavior and neutralizing disruptive elements within the group. The masks appeared at the installation of the death of a chief and at initiation rites of young men, as well as a whole range of occasions that include punishments, warfare, and public works. So the Kifibwe here are kind of like your spiritual police officers. And again, the, they usually come in two genders. They come with these kind of slit eyes, more rounded heads with um, these are the female uh, designs, and then are this very sharp forehead and bulging eyes and mouth, uh, much narrower faces. These are the male uh, kifibwe masks. And these, uh, these are differentiated, the surface coloration, decorative design and patterns on the surface. 
Typically, there is one female mask and a group of male masks, and they come together in a group, and they're meant to be menacing and intimidating and sort of the heightened emotions of the situation. Here you can see what a female mask wearer would look like in full costume. Here are some other examples of male masks. You can again see these really striking, intense, highly charged uh, faces that these uh, sort of rooster-like front parts that really are very dramatic. So this idea of a mask here is used in its way of intimidation as a kind of uh, spiritual force that is, again, a way of sort of asserting the authority of the clan collectively making the clan's authority embodied by the mask. The mask has the power to uh, uh, embarrass and uh, rein in any disruptive behavior. The Bamekele uh, Kuose Society is a very important part of the Kuba. We've talked about the Kuba also. The Kuba, uh, the Bamekeles like the Kuba, uh, that they, they have this sort of image of the elephant. Uh, the the elephant is a, a figure of great nobility. This is not a noble mask. They appear in royal festivals, but they are the the supporters of the king. And so, a kind of herd of elephants. In a sense, these are the the royal ministers, the people who are uh, directly showing their allegiance to the king and authority. And um, each society has its own special house, its own masks, costumes, dances, a secret language, and acting on behalf of the king to establish order and preserve social and religious structures of the kingdom. So again, meant to be kind of intimidating, meant to be a part of a kind of way of asserting authority and a way of kind of commanding uh, the respect of others. A similar example of this can be found in the Kupa Mukinga mask. Now, we talked about the masks of the royal court of the Kuba. Now, the Mukinga is like that in that it has that sort of face of the royal king. But what makes it really strikingly different is it has this sort of tubular form with a palm at the end that comes out of the head. This, again, represents the idea of the elephant's trunk. And the symbol of the elephant is, again, the symbol of royal power, and royal privilege, the ability to get things done, the ability to command and direct powerful forces. And so the Mukenga are not nobility, but they're like the Bamikele. They're a group of people who are joined together to support the nobility. And it's a great honor to be invited into that company as a direct part of the royal court. Now I want to talk about yet another group further further south, the Chokwi, in the Chihongo mask. Now, one of the things that the Chokwis have very distinctive uh, scarification on their faces and the design of the masks are very striking. You notice that they have this kind of inset eyes with these sort of bulging forms, sort of like the pende, but a little bit variant in that, uh, that the eyes are, are really recessed with this sort of uh, cowrie shell-like eyes, these slit eyes. That's sort of a classic chokwe style mask. And you'll see here, the Chihongo mask represents an ancestral chief and symbolizes prosperity. And there is this chilingelenge, this sort of design on the forehead here, this sort of interlocking kind of connected diamond shape at the center of the forehead, that is the symbol of the royal power of the mask. Here is what this costume looks like in full co uh, This is what the mask in full costume looks like. Another very important Chokwe mask is the representation of women. Traditionally, there was the royal woman mask. Whoa. Uh, more commonly now, you see this sort of younger royal woman manifestation of this mask, this idea of beauty and elegance, and no longer do you see this image of authority, and, um, but you, you again, this idea of elegance, and uh, it comes across in the mask of the Moana Po, the younger woman 
of the chokwe. Again, notice that sort of recessed eyes with the sort of cowrie shell-like eyes. Now the Yoruba, going back to the Yoruba, are one of the few cultures that actually has a more developed theatrical tradition. Theatrical traditions are actually fairly rare in Africa because they, you know, where a troupe of actors are performing and interacting and playing out characters in a dramatic way. Typically, the masks we've seen uh, so far, a single performer is standing before a group and uh, playing their character. But there is no sort of dialogue or interaction aside from a few jokes or bits or comic things, interactions between sort of a comic character and the main actor. But in the Alarinjo, we see a much more developed theater, a uh, theater that really plays out roles and personifies known characters. Uh, it's still improvised, but it's there to entertain the audience. And the Alarinjo performers go to market squares and they perform for audiences. And they're connected to the idea of ballad singing from the 17th century. Olobin Olobojo, the king, uh, had enough wealth that he actually hired a troupe of actors to go around and sing his praises. These actors, once they had a kind of steady income, decided they'd do more than just sing the king's praises. They'd get up and start entertaining the audience and doing whatever it took to keep the audience entertained. And so the Alarinjo is a part of this tradition of kind of street theater. There, they just kind of go out there and get the audience excited, and the audience pays them money to be entertained. So this is really kind of like a busker, like a kind of theatrical performance. This is one of these things where people watch the show and being entertained, you know, throw money at the performers. An example of this Alarinja theater here is you see this old man character, and the other mask here represents a young boy. And in this one scene that they play, this young boy is taunting the old man. And uh, the old man is really angry and he gets furious at the young boy. And finally, the young boy pushes him down. And the old man is so old, he mad, he curses the young boy to death. And the young boy falls over dead. And at this point, the audience is really upset and is trying to tell the old man, you can't kill the young boy, he just pushed you down. He's used his black magic inappropriately. And so they set up a scene, this battle between the generations as a way of kind of provoking the audience and creating a kind of stimulating forum for this, again, this idea of the sort of struggle of different generations. Another really interesting theatrical tradition that has grown up in Ghana, now we're moving all the way West Africa. This is a, a modern one. Um, that started in the 20s and 30s when Africans were um, entertainers, hired as entertainers on cruise ships going from West Africa to Europe. And what the Europeans wanted to see at this time, what had been popular since about 1850, 1860, was this called blackface minstrelsy. This was the, the American vaudeville, which had been a, a big deal in the United States. It dies out in the 30s, but it, it continues to go on in Europe and continues to thrive also in Africa. It is still performed today in Africa. Concert party. This is based on blackface minstrelsy. You heard of Jim Crow? Well, this is where that legacy comes from. And yet in Ghana, they don't see this as an insult to their African heritage. Quite the opposite. They see this as a great honor to perform and a great part of their cultural heritage. They have transformed this uh, tradition of blackface minstrelsy into something that speaks to them today and plays out the kinds of roles and characters that are affecting them in their lives. So the stories are more and more contemporized. And this is something we have clown characters and you have beautifully dressed up women. Men play women's roles. Uh, so we have cross-dressing and this kind of fun, antic way. And this is something that's been around for a while and is still popular with audiences in Ghana today.